but also hopefully get in touch with a lot of the other people who are associated with the program. It sounds really exciting as a project and uh, I would also like to know more about it and so happy to kick off the week of seminars talking a little bit about the full moon, uh, which is in a couple of weeks, actually in two weeks. So we're right in the middle between the last full moon and the next full moon. I will, though, first say a little bit more about myself in addition to what Till said, uh, also because I am currently enrolled in a program uh, in Offenbach near Frankfurt, where I am developing a research project on the aesthetics of waiting, which I will explain a little bit more, but mostly working with artists. And I was under the impression that some of the people here tonight would want to know more about that kind of program, what it is to pursue a theoretical or even philosophical project, but in an artistic context. So maybe if you have questions about that or interest, we can talk about it uh, after the presentation, or you can probably get my contact information from Till, and I would be happy to share more about my experience and what I enjoy about it. Uh, having said that, uh, I am by no means tonight to, uh, going to talk about artistic research, strictly speaking. I have the feeling that I am perhaps among experts on the topic uh, and people who practice it and experience it uh, regularly. I myself uh, consider my practice to be divided roughly into sort of mostly scholarly work, curating things, and also writing uh, creatively which I do uh, mostly in Spanish. I see these things though to be highly informed by each other. And that has to do with the fact that I'm currently researching the time of waiting in relationship to contemporary art. What happens when our experiences of art are no longer distinguishable from a waiting experiences? What does that say about temporality? What does that say about how power uh, becomes expressed through time, those who wait and those who let others wait. But I'm also interested in how waiting as a very ambivalent experience uh, can be transformed aesthetically. How art can basically use this time that we normally associate from day-to-day -day life and render it in a different context, change it, modify it. In my research, I argue for better and for worse. I tell you this because I believe that the full moon screenings have also helped me think these things through. It hasn't been the case, and here I'm just sharing your, my screen a little bit. It, it hasn't been the case that I've been basically uh, researching and applying my knowledge that I find in my academic research uh, to a project that I am curating. It's not that the theory sort of informs the practice. I think the, the experience of it, but also the process of it, they're really hard to distinguish from each other. And I find that the, that the screenings have also helped me to think about how people wait in front of images, for example. Not only for the film to begin, eh, but also for something to happen, eh, for events to get carried out, expectations and so on. Uh, but I wanted to first, having sort of introduced and framed it like that, wanted to show you just a little quick image of what our screenings have been so far in a way. We started Full Moon screenings a couple of years ago in 2019 and would mostly invite friends, acquaintances, fellow artists, uh, on the full moon to share some food and watch some movies. When I say movies, of course, I mean that very loosely. We have usually sort of uh, edited and cut things and uh, 
shown them sort of as edited, sometimes adulterated uh, artifacts. François, in the second half of this uh, lecture, who as you might have heard, is the co-founder of the Full Moon Screening, will go into more detail about how each or individual screening really work out. I wanted to first just show you a little bit of one, which we did in, uh, at a friend's apartment from Jamie Grotnik and Vinci Radalati. And we basically took over the huge living room and transformed it into a sort of movie screen uh, by using a mirror, uh, but also by inviting a bunch of people, uh, creating an event around them, hosting them, serving food that usually had some sort of relationship to the moon or to the material we were showing. So they became spaces of uh, hosting, of sharing, and also of coming together. I'll, sh I'll play for you a little snippet just of uh, what we showed that night. That was uh, Candy Darling, who is uh, usually known as the uh, Andy uh, Warhol superstar around Andy Warhol's factory, who was in several of his films, uh, but was also a performer, a singer, and was also in Werner Schröter's film, who's a West German filmmaker. Uh, and that was a little snippet that we isolated and uh, showed in that screening. I mentioned also Candy Darling because uh, she stems also from a scene, uh, mostly in, the, in New York in the 60s and 70s, that, that is very queer, that is sometimes known as the film underground, and that has been actually quite important for the full moon screenings and how we develop them, as well as for my research on waiting. Uh, here, let me show you another slide. And it's basically through Jack Smith that I personally arrived at this idea of waiting. Jack Smith is a filmmaker associated with the scene that I was telling you about, whose first film was a sensation, but got censored uh, wrongly due to pornography, which made him to never finish another film in his life but he continued to create film material, re-editing the film into different lengths, changing the music, the order, always changing the titles, never considered it done. This is very much about his practice, but it is something that we have also playfully taken into our idea of the full moon screening. Sometimes we change the names uh, of how we spell full moon, or sometimes there's screamings instead of screenings, thanks to a friend's suggestion. So from Smith, we have found this sort of very committed practice to images and never letting 
an image or an artwork or an experience be finished and stable to always be sort of adapting it and letting it change but remaining playful. Uh, I look at Smith in my, in my own research on waiting uh, in terms of the performances he would create, which were at his apartment, which was his studio, uh, which would start at midnight, around midnight usually, were free, uh, were shared through posters, but also through word of mouth among friends, and had no exact beginning or end. People would come to his apartment, to his studio apartment, invited, expecting a performance, but never really knowing when it would begin. I started noticing when looking at his uh, work and his performances that people tended to describe them as waiting. That they were like, we were waiting for Jack to show up, to finish preparing, to finally play a record, to put on the slideshow, to show us a reel, to re-edit it. All these events were sort of at the border between life and art, between workplace and living place, between professional and collegiate friendship, uh, between events open to everyone and events really only accessible to a extended queer community, basically. I look at them in my research as waiting rooms where people would come and wait together uh, I think that coming together around images, uh, in his case, meant they were waiting for him. I don't think we're exactly doing the same thing in a full moon screening, but there are several elements of how we create these events, how we invite people, how we curate them, that function similarly to Smith. This is a little uh, still from a, a snippet from a movie that has been re-edited under multiple titles in which uh, he basically films people playing music uh, and uh, rest up in very specific outfits. I think this is what one would call a very performative practice, even though it's in the example I'm using working through video. I would say that's a style that's a formal feature that we pursue in a lot of the full moon screenings, which I think Francois will show more concrete images, and maybe you can see the differences and the similarities. Uh, I don't think that what we're doing with the full moon screenings is also only anchored in a historical academic interest of mine and that I share it with Francois which is this sort of uh, Smith world and all the characters that exist around it. it here's images from uh, the founders of Cheap Club. And you see on the right, Susanne Sasse, who is sort of the acting present mastermind of this collective that is based in Berlin, as well as Daniel Hendrickson and Mark Siegel, who also uh, are the founders of this collective that currently does more of concerts, they do performances, they do durational evenings, uh, where it works as a style of cabaret with different collaborators having moments uh, in the piece. This is their current practice. What I like about them and what uh, we have discussed about them are their, their club events. They started in the late 90s, early 2000s, as cheap club, where they basically had access to studio space in Hall, uh, in Berlin, and they started organizing these parties where they would involve performance, screenings, but also a celebration, a coming together. And they would act as sort of the curators, the hosts, but also the performing artists. So for me, cheap, is a really interesting example of where sometimes these neat differences between professions or titles of certain professions collapse. And what is for me at the center of these efforts are sort of a collaborative practice that sort of diffuses authorship in certain points that is very much about inviting 
in hosting other people, about extending the spotlight, uh, and maybe just about having a good time uh, around art. I also would like to say that most of these practices that I'm mentioning are quite inofficial in their beginning. I mean, I think maybe you've got an, an idea of that in terms of the screening at Reihenberger Straße that I mentioned, where it was in a friend's apartment, but Smith as well, or cheap club, they were very sort of DIY in this sense. I mean, cheap especially started and has more of this sort of like uh, anarcho communist, uh, punky attitude to them. Susanne Sachs uh, emphasizes a lot sort of their communist vibe as an East German actress and artist, for example, something that they also play with. I wanted to show you just a little clip. Uh, also so that you see and here you also have a, a shot of vaginal davis who's one of the permanent members of cheap because cheap over the years also invites other artists to momentarily join their collective and do things together such as bruce le bruce or the music band shoo shoo uh, vaginal davis being one of the permanent ones here just a little clip of a film they recently released at the beginning of the pandemic as a five-part series. And I show you just the intro credit. also another artist going back to the 70s a little bit, uh, Elio Oitisica, who was also uh, an installation artist exiled in New York for a brief moment. And that's where he developed his, his Cosmococas, which were installations around uh, media consumption and basically hanging out. Oitisica is an artist who I appreciate a lot and I've thought about a lot in terms of the aesthetics of waiting and creating these waiting rooms because he had this idea that one of the most important coordinates of art and creativity was leisure. And he had this uh, concept he called crelacer, which is a combination of like creation and leisure. Uh, he spoke about waiting for the internal sun as this sort of like very introspective, subjective process of finding ideas, but also of like slowing down, of not working. And in the Cosmococas, a lot of that is at play. Here you see a pool he created, uh, for example, and then there would be a screening on the right. On the left, you see a room with hammocks and then a slide installation it was constantly alternating, uh, and there you were able also to listen to music. Uh, here we also wanted to show you a last sort of slide from it where you see a close-up of a Hendrix cover covered in cocaine. For him, the idea of hanging out in the Cosmococcus was not only about media consumption, but also about drug consumption. For him, that was an instance of not working, of a anti-capitalist sort of coordinate of art, of his art, at least. I am not <laughs> equating our full moon screening to his Cosmococas, which have been shown in museums and also in art spaces, but I am interested in this coming together, in this hanging out, in making sort of art and the experience of art a very collaborative moment 
also a moment perhaps in which work enters a different realm, also in which how you physically uh, exist in a space uh, is intentionally curated. I think that's something that I've, uh, while doing the, uh, the full moon screenings, I've learned to think and appreciate about a lot. Ponzo and I always spend time thinking how to set up the space so that there's flow, so that it's comfortable, how to sort of curate also a moment of watching together. And uh, I think maybe I leave it at that for now. Hopefully uh, we can talk more in detail after Francois speaks. Uh, and I wanted to show you just a little something else uh, before Francois continues talking. So while we have this little palette cleanser, I guess um, what might be interested in talking about the full moon screenings a little bit more in specific, like in particular, like how each event or some of these events worked. I hope that like some ideas about like how we're curating works together will come through more clearly. Um, but maybe already you get a sense of like, how we think of curating as something that has to do with remixing, um, with hosting, and really with like creating events. So something that's in time and has a kind of dramaturgy to it. This is an image of actually one of the first full moon screenings that we did. And we of course started by showing the Méliès film. Um, and it was in my studio at the time and uh, we invited some friends. It was really an experiment in like how to gather in a moment that is special and punctual and but also quite changing and how we can kind of have somewhat of a loose structure uh, that changes with the moon, let's say, and with the moods. Um, but one thing that does stay is that maybe you've gathered, so we will serve food and watch something, some kind of moving image together. Um, this was one of the first one. And I want to mention that we showed, for example, this film, which was a silent film and has had like different soundtracks over the years. And one of the things that I enjoy with these screenings is that we will kind of put our own sound sometimes to the images. And this is really informed as well by like, or inspired by Jack Smith, who would kind of constantly remix his own works. And he would basically like screen footage of his films and have a record player on the side and always be playing different music. Interesting that now these works kind of exist, that they're, because they're not being performed anymore, they've stayed a little bit fixed. Sometimes they literally have been put with a certain soundtrack that is not how it was necessarily like intended to stay. So that's one of the things that we like to do is kind of play with images in that way and kind of keep updating them. Uh, of course, within like the limits of respect for artists that are like living and practicing and like, um, so there's, these are maybe also interesting questions to think about after in terms of like remixing and working with other people's work and how do you, how much can you modify or how much do you have to like stay true to it and what, what about also the context and how you're showing it like influences the work and how it changes your experience of it. But yeah, we're really interested in like different ways of experiencing different works basically. And I think that was quite clear with all the examples that Jose was uh, showing you. I want to talk about um, two or uh, three or four specific examples of screenings that we've done and how we decided to do it because the format, except for the fact that there is food and moving images, the format changes a lot in terms of like what kind of program and how it occupies uh, the time, whether it's like a moment of screening that is more like in, uh, in a specific time or whether it's something that is more like bleeding throughout the evening. Uh, this is the last one that we did on January 6th for the full moon and cancer. 
but uh, we had just recently met a friend and filmmaker called Kathy Lee Crane. And we decided that we wanted to do this full moon screening with her or starting with her work. And this is a, one of the ways that we've kind of consistently worked is that we will kind of team up with one artist and show their work and then create a kind of playlist around their work uh, that contextualizes it or uh, maybe creates like nice um, complementary tones to the films. Uh, so it's kind of starting from one artist's work and creating like a program from there. And with this, in this case, we chose two of her films, one from the beginning of her film career, which is called Not For Nothing from 1996, and was kind of a long, like a 30 minute film that was uh, very much inspired by like early silent films, this kind of Louise Brooks lookalike character uh, here that you see performing in front of a recreation of the set from Der Blaue Engel with Marlene Dietrich. So there is very much this cabaret aspect, which is something that kind of is in our repertoire, let's say, and a lot of the works that, as you've seen with the Candy Darling, a lot of the works that we like to show are like basically like filmed performances and musical acts. And we'll come back to this, but basically also because the screening in these events often literally play the role of a kind of musical act as the that accompanies the social gathering um and then you have here on the right the on the line a film from 2010 that has a very different aesthetic and i think you can already see it from here it's much more like a stan brackage type film uh with uh, 16 millimeter like filming landscapes the editing quite like choppy uh, and playful with like a music, but very really just landscapes and no character. So going from a film that had that was very much about this character staged per, like diva, let's say, and going into a film that basically has no character and is more about the landscape, but still had a very like dramatic uh, feeling with the music, like playful and dramatic. So we gave each other, we gave ourselves a little bit the challenge to like create the playlist that would bring you from one to the other. And I'm going to go quickly through what we decided to do. So we started with a clip from Jean Genet, Un Chant d'Amour. I'm oh, sorry, I, I didn't write that right here. So it's Jean Genet, Un Chant d'Amour, which is again a film that is silent, that has had like different um, music played to it over time. Um, and we put our own uh, soundtrack to it. And it was just a clip. So we really showed like one clip of it. Uh, and then we moved into Tally, a performance by Tally Brown singing Heroes by D David Bowie. That is an excerpt from the documentary. Um, that's the, the documentary called Tally Brown, New York from 1979. It's a documentary from Rosa von Pronheim. And it's like a very nice like one shot starting from far, zooming in to this performer. She's quite still, but has like a very strong like uh, emoting with the face. Um, and then this, and you can see it already here. We really use also like sometimes formal elements to, to create links between certain films. And I actually um, wanted to show that evening uh, a, f a film of mine I mean as we said these are like very um, in a sense like informal settings that are very much about the social and the community and in, in, in that sense it makes a lot of sense we did it in Montreal which is where I'm from and it was important somehow for me to show one of my films to my friends who were there but also that it would make it anyways made sense because um, this idea of the cabaret and the film performances is something that I work with a lot, which maybe opens up a little bit this question of like these screenings and how I see them as part of my artistic practice or not, and how they relate and don't relate, which is maybe something we can talk about more after. Um, so there's this formal connection between the two with this kind of uh, face that is like luminous with a spotlight, let's say. Uh, which I find starts to look a little bit like the moon. Um, and then it went into the film by Kathy Lee Crane, which was a, really like the body of the, the program being 30 minutes long. Um, 
and as you can see a little bit here with the images there you know there's a connection with the champ d'amour with this kind of like uh, vegetation and that scene is very like sensual and the scene from a champ d'amour is also like this very sensual scene um and i want to mention also because this is what led to like how the screening progressed there were elements in the film that uh were using like very much like orientalist imagery to kind of have uh, it was using also because it was working with the the trope of the silent film so it also made sense in that in that way like um in that way but it was something that um we wanted to somehow address um but how could we address it like within the program and with the selection of films that we show it with because we also didn't find that it was problematic enough to not show it but we didn't want to like um just somehow address it and we chose to do that by having right afterwards a performance uh, a video of a performance by Kazuo Ono called Admirando a Argentina from 1997 and if you don't know the work of Kazuo Ono it's like this um buto dance from that comes from Japan it's kind of this post-war um movement um usually with this makeup so uh this white face is very like theatrical but um and she does these performances that are really um look like and these ones uh, she's clearly like dressed a little bit like la catrina which is like a mexican character related to the day of the dead and that um whole cosmology let's say so it was a, a cheeky way to kind of address the 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 phenomenon let's say of like cultural appropriation and that kind of drag um without necessarily like speaking about it so directly and it was interesting for us to have this performance shown because it's basically like this dying diva and uh the diva is really like an important character in these cabaret um this uh cabaret imagery so in in the arc of the screening it kind of like created a moment that was a little bit like the crescendo it's very dramatic it's like this I forget if it's like Beethoven or something the music playing and we sped it up actually because uh, it's really quite slow <laughs> otherwise the movement but we sped it up so it had this a little bit hectic quality and it and we cut it at a very sharp moment so the idea was to create a crescendo and I mentioned this because like we create the screenings really as a kind of playlist and we think of it like in terms of rhythm and tempo and like uh and and really in a way quite musically which will make sense when you see some of the other um iterations of the screenings so I'm from Kazuo Ono which was this kind of crescendo then we went to Ana Mendieta which is a silent work like three minute long and quite still so it's I mean, the image is very grainy and uh, in a way moving a lot, but there's not much happening. It's called Grass Breathing from 1975. And you slowly end up noticing that the ground is like kind of uh, like going up and down as if some as, as if it's breathing. But there's a kind of playful maybe feeling of like uh, as if someone would come out of the ground uh, so this diva that we just watched kind of dramatically dying is like coming back from the grave after something kind of playful and from there it led us somehow like the disintegration of that character that diva into the into the ground and and it led us somehow to this last film that is more about these landscapes uh filmed at the tropic of cancer and it's somehow like a failed experiment and because apparently at a certain time at the Tropic of Cancer you don't have a shadow and Kathy Lee was trying to film this but kind of missed the time so it's really uh, this film also about like this missed timing and it ends with this big cement ball which we find nice that it has this formal relationship to the moon um so this is a little visualization of, let's say, the, the dramaturgy of the screening. I move on to another example that kind of shows like another modality of the screening. So it was similar in the sense that we worked together with one artist. 
Chaldon Diaz and it was really to showcase his work. But I want to use this example to talk about social community, let's say, aspect of it, but and also this other modality that is more about like hanging out and having visuals play in the room more like in a, as a kind of background or accompanying to the social event. So we did have a moment of screening. It was important for us. The uh, Charlton is a longtime friend and collaborator of mine that was showing a work at the Canadian Pavilion in Berlin for the Berlinale. So he was in town showing one work and we took the opportunity to create a screening uh, around other of his work so that people in Berlin that we knew could get to know his practice more. So it's really like this kind of trying to, yeah, work with the different publics and give his work also like a contextualizing it in a certain way. It, it was interesting for us to try to frame it. So um, his films use a lot of animation and music. And so we chose to show it with Charles Atlas because we must, which is like a classic of like dance films, like queer dance films using the green screen, a lot of animation and effects. And it's this kind of Baroque imagery that really relates to Charlton's work. Charlton is also a dancer and performs a lot in the video. So it was kind of important to make that connection. Then we showed a music video by Mu called Paris Hilton for the song Paris Hilton from 2004, which is like this video practice um, really from like the beginning of internet and YouTube. And like, uh, so yeah, it was important to bring in that like that history, let's say. And then it was the musical and we had a clip from Tommy, the musical with Tina Turner singing the song Acid Queen. Uh, so bring in also this kind of psychedelic 70s. So that was uh, just for us to kind of frame his work. Uh, but what I was wanting to talk about, especially was that then after having shown the screening, which was maybe 45 minutes, we then recycled the images, let's say, and kept them playing in the room and then had just music playing and went back to the socializing aspect, which for us is very important like the dinner aspect gives us a moment to like stay after having watched the images together and have a like more convivial environment to kind of digest the works basically as you're eating. Creating this environment to then kind of have an afterlife for the images as well that would be like consumed in a different way. And, and this we've done uh, also in different places in different ways like we've also done it where like there is no moment of screening and always just like this playlist playing so we do work often with videos um, that have a musical quality we've shown grace jones one woman show a lot because it's basically like a beautiful filmed concert that is or and film performance i think here you see in the background uh erica badu's quarantine concerts which are really amazing uh films as well and you can see that we placed the buffet there so like people would go back to get food and could watch a bit the film but we had another area where we were all convening and this was done in a garden um and i want to like continuing with this idea of like different publics and creating like a kind of community around the work we've also done it where the format is quite a lot more traditional this is from uh, this last December, where we screened the recently restored version of Rote Ohren Fetzen durch Asche, Flaming Ears, from 1991 by Ursula Pyra, Dietmar Schipek, and Ashley Hans Scheil um, so at Citypunkt in Berlin, which is like an artist run space that is very much like trying to make more like events that engage the community um, in, in terms of like consuming contemporary or uh, art basically and we made a screening there with uh in in collaboration or in partnership with bed death which is a kind of evening of like queer and trans uh films that already existed at city point so we teamed up with them to show this film which is this um it was self-described like a uh, radical lesbian sci-fi fantasy um, from the 90s, um, recently restored. So we got in touch with the artist who, who luckily lives in Berlin. And so she was present as well. And it was really 
what was nice about reshowing this like film from the 90s that was recently restored with a new public uh different generation as well and really it felt like we managed to really bring together because of the partnership with bed death and city punkt and the artist herself and the public that we have uh, it's something that we enjoy to try to like mix the publics like this and create this community and we had food um, which is always an important thing like somehow we need to find spaces that have kitchens and it has been something that informs a lot like the format uh, of where these things happen so i'm gonna just finish with mentioning another form just uh that is a little bit like an offshoot from everything we've been talking about but um I want to put it in as well because I think it's an interesting way also of thinking of curating and consuming media, like media consumption. But during the pandemic, we couldn't obviously do the gathering part, which was essential to the screenings. And I know I'm sure you remember in 2020, like the the way that like like all of a sudden like everything was available online and being made available for you to kind of consume films and things online and we were in that environment trying to figure out how and if to continue with our full moon screenings and we did one experiment uh, that I want to mention with Carolina Mendoza that was called Media Mansi. And Carolina Mendoza is someone who works a lot, is, works more in the world of like performance uh, as a tra dramaturge, but also like basically performance artist and works a lot with like these impossible practices. Um, so I think she's worked with like target reading, which is a way of trying to locate things that are far away through a kind of te communal telepathy in a way. Uh, she's worked with like dreams, uh, communicating with the dead, levitation, and like so trying basically, yeah, and she frames them as impossible practices and how to like deal with them. And together with her, we came up with this experiment in media mancy, which would be a way of like reading into reading into signs, basically. And I mean the the practices of divination are just about like finding meaning and sense in like anything basically you can find in the leaves of your tea and the cup so we made one about like media mancy so we created two exercises where, which were basically ways for you to reflect and to read into the things that you had recently consumed or watched so we didn't propose any new content but we created a kind of framework and an exercise which was basically a guided audio exercise uh into finding ways to like re or like watch a new watch differently certain things that you had seen and find new meaning in it and we could talk more about this but i'll leave it at that and i think yeah maybe we continue with questions or but that's that's it for my end of the presentation